So welcome to this uh, launch event of the 2022 update of the Istanbul Protocol, a manual on the effective investigation and documentation of uh, torture and all the cruel inhuman or degrading treatment of punishment. Uh, this event uh, is co-organized by the Geneva Academy and the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights and in particular, uh, the Istanbul Protocol Editorial Committee. I'm Gloria Gajoli, I'm an Associate Professor at the University of Geneva and I'm the Director of the Geneva Academy of International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights. I'm thrilled and uh, really delighted to see such a packed room. I hope it's not too warm. <laughs> uh, but I'm really delighted to, to see that there is such a, a, a great interest for this lunch. You know, we are here at the Villa Moignet, which is a very particular building. You see the surroundings, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, we're in the middle of uh, International Geneva. But moreover, uh, this is a historical building. Uh, the first Geneva Conventions were discussed uh, and signed here in this room, the Cassese room. So you see, it's a room full of symbol, and it's a place that is particularly fixed for such an endeavor. I would like also to welcome the broader audience uh, that is online. Uh, we have more than 1,000 people registered for this event. Uh, so this is really, really exceptional, and we are very happy about that. I would like to start by thanking uh, our partners for having approached the Academy for this launch. Uh, this type of events uh, really participates in strengthening uh, the Geneva Academy as a human rights hub within the hub of international Geneva. The substantive links with our teaching and research are numerous. And um, as uh, our institution has also hosted for many years the Special Rapporteur on Culture and Other CIDT, Mr. Niels Meltzer, we are very uh, happy to be able to, to launch this, uh, this um, uh, Istanbul Protocol here. The prohibition of torture, as we know, is one of the most fundamental prohibitions in international human rights law. It's part of the use code against rules. It is, however, constantly violated. Rules are strong, but the implementation is often too weak. Endeavors like the update of the Istanbul Protocol or the Mendes principles, which were also discussed uh, at the Geneva Academy, we had an event on this in December last year. This type of documents not only flesh out the rules, but also contribute to the vital respect for these rules, which protect human dignity. And this mirrors really the convictions here at the Geneva Academy that practical and authoritative guidance on the implementation of international rules and standards is crucial and needs to be developed constantly. I would thus like to congratulate uh, the OHCHR and the Istanbul Protocol Editorial Committee for the extremely important work of the 2022 update of the Istanbul Protocol. This update is very impressive. You can see, look at this. I mean, that's really substantial. <laughs> So it has involved six years of work and 180 experts from over 50 countries. So I'm really sure that the 2022 Istanbul Protocol bring, we, will bring us one step closer to a world without torture. Please let me now welcome and thank our high level speakers. And I would like to welcome and thank in particular the High Commissioner for Human Rights Ms. Micheline uh, Bachelet, who will deliver the introductory remarks. And unfortunately, Ms. Bachelet will not be able to be uh, at the villa with us, but we are very happy that the technology allows us to see you online and to hear your introductory remarks. And I'm going to abuse the fact that I'm here to thank you for the, the deep and strong collaboration we've had uh, and we are having with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. It's always a pleasure. So thank you very much. And now, without further ado, I give the floor to our moderator, Mr. James Lin uh, from the International Rehabilitation Council for Torture Victims. Mr. Lin, you have the floor. Thank you, Gloria. <coughs> uh, I mean, while the High Commissioner is waiting patiently, uh, I'm giving you up to make very correct remarks. I won't say much. Uh, but I would just like to highlight, uh, as Gloria has mentioned, uh, this truly has been a milestone. Uh, this project has been undergoing for about six years. Um, so when someone tells you we're going to bring together a group of experts from 51 countries, uh, 
and revise the protocol in uh, three years' time and it'll be printed and published. And I don't believe them. <laughs> so, uh, but this is really literally, uh, and I think it is important to acknowledge at the beginning. This product is the product of thousands, if not tens of thousands, of voluntary hours by experts around the world, um, all formulated into working groups, uh, thousands of emails, thousands of communications, uh, hundreds of heated debates, and uh, finally we are here today. Uh, so with uh, no further delay, um, please, uh, I'd like to welcome the High Commissioner, Michelle Bachelet, uh, to make introductory remarks. Thank you very much, um, uh, James, and uh, uh, I'm, 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 I'm really sad not to be there with you in presence, and particularly to have missed that great photograph that you had. <laughs> well, Excellencies, colleagues and friends, thank you to the Geneva Academy of International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights for hosting this event. It is an honor to be here with you today. Torture has been, uh, have, can be wide ranging and complex forms. At its simplest, it implies the infliction of unbearable mental and physical pain on fellow human beings who are defenseless and captive. It is an act of extreme cowardice, and it is one of the most brutal human rights violations that exist. As such, its absolute prohibition form part of customary international law. Torture is not only illegal, it is repugnant and corrosive and leaves in its way deep trauma and suffering. Over two decades ago, my office published the first edition of the Istanbul Protocol after extensive consultations and work by a broad range of stakeholders, as had been mentioned before. It was a milestone moment in the fight against torture. It has been since used worldwide and routinely relied upon by national bodies, civil society organizations, individual practitioners, and international human rights mechanisms. The updates to the original chapters that are being presented include recent jurisprudence on torture prevention, accountability, and effective remedies. The new content also provides added guidance for judges, prosecutors, and health professionals, outlining good practices on legal investigations of torture and ill treatment. It also provides guidance to states on the effective implementation of its international obligations to prevent and fight torture and ill treatment. Colleagues, the international community committed to eradicate torture when it adopted the conventions against torture and other cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment or punishment. And no, no less than 173 states have today ratified the convention. In doing so, countries accept a legal obligation to proactively prevent torture and other ill treatment, including through legislative reform, training and monitoring, and to ensure accountability. They also have the duty to provide victims with adequate redress, including rehabilitation. But despite our shared commitment to prevent and eradicate torture and ill treatment, we continue to observe and document that across the globe. From places of deprivation of liberty to conflict-related situations, amidst a demonstration and their suppression, or as part of investigation methods, torture remains pervasive and endemic. It happens more often, again, persons living in poverty, to make them confess crimes they often did not commit. And at times can also be related to the lack of forensic capacity related to crime-solving targets by investigative authorities. We are a long way from winning the battle. In 2021, the UN Voluntary Fund for Victims of Torture assisted more than 47,000 torture victims and their families in 79 countries. We know today that the regular monitoring of places of deprivation of liberty by national and international independent oversight mechanism is one of the most effective methods of preventing torture. We also know that when torture happens, properly trained professionals must have prompt and unimpeded access to victims and witnesses. This is crucial to ensure that perpetrators are held accountable and that victims have access to redress measures. Colleagues, the Istanbul Protocol continues to serve as a landmark reference in such medical legal investigations and documentation. The United Nations anti-torture mechanisms, such as the Committee Against Torture and the Subcommittee on Prevention of Torture and the Special Rapporteur on Torture, have routinely recommended that countries establish and provide training programs for personnel tasked with medical examinations 
on the assessment of torture and ill treatment. They have stated that this progress must be in accordance with international standards and guidelines, including the Istanbul Protocol. They have also encouraged training of the prosecution and the judiciary on how to evaluate forensic reports. The UN Voluntary Fund for Victims of Torture has for years also been supporting civil society organizations to document acts of torture in line with the Istanbul Protocol's methodology. In addition, the Istanbul Protocol has guided the work of international accountability mechanisms, including investigations, commissions of inquiry, and fact-finding missions. This mechanism, which my office continues to provide expertise and support to, are increasingly turned into responding to serious violations of international humanitarian law and international human rights law. We are keenly aware that investigations into torture and ill treatment allegations are complex, wide ranging and require multidisciplinary expertise. For this reason, effective clinical investigations and documentations with in, which include gathering rigorous testimonial evidence, as well as physical and psychological evidence are essential to corroborate allegations. As the four UN anti-torture mechanism pointed out on the occasion of the International Day in support of victims of torture, healthcare professionals have essential roles to play in preventing and documenting torture as well as rehabilitating its victims. I am pleased to see their roles well reflected and the revised version of the Istanbul Protocol. I have no doubt that the improvements to the protocol will strengthen the capacity of professionals to undertake meaningful investigations that can contribute to ultimately ensuring accountability. I want to salute the work of medical professionals and human rights defenders around the world who often risk their lives to undertake this invaluable work. I invite states to make the Istanbul Protocol an essential part of trading for all relevant public officials and medical professionals. I finally, and finally, I urge those states that have not yet ratified the Convention Against Torture and its optional protocol to do so as a matter of priority, as well as other relevant treaties that prohibit torture and ill treatment. You now have an updated and immensely practical tool to help you give full effect to those instruments. Many of you here today are working tirelessly to ensure that the international community upholds commitment to prohibit torture without exception. As we honor and remember torture victims, let us all dedicate our efforts to their right to obtain reparations, including compensation, rehabilitation, and a guarantee that it will never happen again. I thank you for your attention. Uh, well, thank you, uh, the High Commissioner. Uh, as, as you've heard, uh, the Istanbul Protocol has been uh, used in a, uh, a broad spectrum of activities uh, around the world. I think what makes this document very special is, is entirely that, the, the multidisciplinary nature of the uh, document, as well as the fact that it uh, provides guidance both to civil society and states. Um, and very much, uh, you know, if you, you may know, the first version was actually published in 2004. Um, well, 2001, edited in 2004. Uh, so this very much, this, this represents 20 years of lessons learned uh, and good and best practice that we have sort of worked on throughout the years um, in implementation. Uh, so to begin uh, the conversation this, uh, this day, uh, we will have uh, remarks by Vincent de Yacopino, many of whom you know. Um, formerly retired, uh, we're trying to get him to retire. <laughs> <laughs> what position is he in right? Uh, I think James was still in grammar school in 2001. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, and um, welcome, dear friends, colleagues, and distinguished guests. I would like to express our profound gratitude to High Commissioner Bachelet for her unwavering support of the Istanbul Protocol, and to the many OHCHR staff and representatives of the UN anti-torture bodies for 25 years of partnership in developing, strengthening, and promoting Istanbul Protocol standards. We honor this enduring partnership today in launching the new edition of the Istanbul Protocol. We do so on behalf of torture victims and survivors around the world 
to aid them in the struggle for justice and healing, and to realize a world in which respect for human dignity and the rule of law triumphs over the rule of force through state-sanctioned violence. We thank the Geneva Academy of International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights and Directors Gloria Gaggioli and Felix Kirschmeier for hosting this historic event and promoting the Istanbul Protocol in the Geneva Academy's human rights activities. And most of all, we wish to express our gratitude to the victims and survivors of torture whose courage and resilience inspire us every day. And to persevere and act in the face of enormous challenges. Before we begin our interactive panel discussion, I'd like to say a few words about the Istanbul Protocol, including why and how we strengthened its guidance. More than two decades ago, we gathered not far from here at the Palais Wilson to celebrate the first launch of the Istanbul Protocol. At that time, we had no idea just how significant the Istanbul Protocol would become or how extensively it would be used. But we understood the guidance that we created, the need for the guidance that we created. Before the Istanbul Protocol, there was no standard by which to judge the quality and accuracy of medical legal evaluations. Consequently, high quality medical legal evaluations conducted by clinical experts in civil society were often excluded from judicial and administrative proceedings while at the same time, inadequate and inaccurate state forensic evaluations were routinely admitted into evidence. We understood from our experience that the failure of states to ensure effective forensic evidence of torture was deliberate and instrumental to states' denials of torture and treatment. The Istanbul Protocol established guidance to break through such den denials of torture and the cycles of impunity that sustain it. The guidance was designed to ensure states fulfill their treaty obligations to investigate, prosecute, and punish torture, and to empower civil society with a framework to hold perpetrators accountable and afford victims the redress and rehabilitation that they are entitled to under international law. It also provided an international point of reference to prevent neglect, misinterpretation, or falsification of tortured evidence by health professionals either willingly or under coercion. Since those early days at the Palais Wilson, the Istanbul Protocol and its principles have earned the status as the global standard for legal and clinical investigation and documentation of torture and ill-treatment. They have been recognized by human rights courts and international, regional, and national human rights bodies and legal mechanisms, and are routinely used to measure the effectiveness of investigations into torture by the Committee Against Torture, the Special Rapporteur on Torture, and the Subcommittee on Prevention of Torture. The Istanbul Protocol has guided clinicians around the world to conduct medical legal investigations and has informed a broad range of anti-torture activities. These include advocacy for accountability, prevention, and policy reform, as well as training for health professionals and legal experts and rehabilitation for torture survivors. It has enabled first ever torture convictions in countries where torture is widespread and systematic and the exposure of clandestine torture regimes. It routinely facilitates the production of clinical evidence that is often critical in adjudicating claims of asylum seekers fleeing persecution and has been recognized by courts as relevant guidance for clinical evaluations of asylum applicants. So why then did we strengthen, we decide to strengthen the Istanbul Protocol? The answer is simple. Despite successes in guiding uh, anti-torture activities in many countries, torture persists in more than half the world's countries. To be effective in our anti-torture work, we recognize the need to update the Istanbul Protocol with advances in torture jurisprudence, investig investigation and documentation practices, and additional implementation guidance to states and civil society based on implementation experiences in more than 40 countries during the past 22 years. To this end, we began a large-scale effort six years ago to update and strengthen Istanbul Protocol guidance by recruiting more than 180 clinical, legal, and human rights experts from 51 countries. The initiative was coordinated by four civil society organizations, Physicians for Human Rights, the International Rehabilitation Council for Torture Victims, the Human Rights Foundation of Turkey, and Redress, and the four core UN anti-torture bodies, the Committee Against Torture, the Subcommittee on Prevention of Torture, Special Rapporteur on Torture, and the UN Voluntary Fund for Victims of Torture. Dignity, Danish Institute, Institute Against Torture, facilitated the project by hosting international coordination meetings. And the UN Voluntary Fund for Victims of Torture provided financial support 
but it was otherwise supported through the generous voluntary commitment and time of the individual experts and organizations involved. Coordination of this mammoth project was no simple task. Why am I smiling? Um, <laughs> first, in order to develop international consensus on how to strengthen the ACM protocol, we conducted regional coordination meetings in Bishkek, Mexico City, and Copenhagen, and a survey of more than 200 individuals with experience using the ACM protocol uh, in anti-torture activities. This was followed by several rounds of drafting by eight working groups, led by chapter editors and supervised by the Istanbul Protocol Editorial Committee in coordination with OHCHR. Our final work product more than doubled the length of the Istanbul Protocol. The changes are too numerous to list here today. Suffice it to say, the new edition reflects advances in the global understanding of the practices and effects of torture and ill treatment and includes updates on important legal issues. It clarifies the definition and scope of torture, jurisprudence on torture prevention, accountability, and redress, and outlines current legal investigation practices, as well as new guidance for judges, prosecutors, and other actors. Important updates include the new World Medical Association statement on the ethical obligation for health professionals to document and report torture whenever it is alleged or suspected. Additional guidance is provided on how to address conflicting ethical obligations. For example, when the alleged victim's autonomy conflicts with the duty to document and report torture and treatment. The updated standards guide the conduct of clinical evaluations of physical and psychological evidence, including new guidance on evaluations of children and of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and intersex persons. There's also more consistent guidance on the interpretation of physical and psychological evidence of torture and treatment, as well as on the obligation of clinicians to provide a conclusion on the possibility of torture in all medical legal clinical evaluations. To prevent misuse of the Istanbul Protocol, the new edition clearly identifies its utility and limitations, namely that the Istanbul Protocol is a useful tool for corroborating specific alleg allegations of abuse with clinical evidence. The absence of such evidence does not exclude the possibility of torture, however, and should not be used as a, as a basis to exonerate perpetrators, as we have observed in some countries. In addition, we have replaced the terms medical experts and evaluations with clinical experts and evaluations to ensure that states do not exclude relevant mental health professionals from the documentation process. The new edition also clarifies the role of health professionals in non-legal contexts, such as monitoring and prevention visits, and provides guidance to states and civil society on effective investigation and documentation practices in these contexts. And to ensure that states take comprehensive and sustained actions necessary to implement Istanbul Protocol standards, the new edition provides detailed implementation guidance, a roadmap for states on the conditions necessary for successful implementation of the Istanbul Protocol, and a framework for civil society to ensure state accountability. Such implementation guidance calls for a sea change in how legal, judicial, health, and law enforcement sectors work effectively in collaboration with international actors and members of civil society. Torture is one of the most heinous crimes known to humanity, not only because it involves the intentional infliction of severe and physical mental pain, but because it is committed by or with the acquiescence of state officials and often concealed effectively to prevent justice and accountability. Torture is a profound concern for the world community because it threatens the health, dignity, and well being of us all in our hopes for a brighter future. We must seek an end to torture in our time. The new and strengthened edition of the Istanbul Protocol brings us one step closer to a world without torture by providing states with critical guidance to fulfill their treaty obligations and by empowering civil society with the framework to hold states accountable. In fact, the extent to which states implement Istanbul Protocol standards should be considered a measure of their commitment to ending torture and ill treatment. We therefore call upon states and non-state actors, civil society, individual practitioners, and everyone concerned in preventing and protecting against torture and ill treatment to use the new edition of the Istanbul Protocol for the sake of torture survivors and victims everywhere and to preserve and protect our humanity for future generations. Thank you. Now, just to, so everyone knows, everyone has the agenda, but we are going to begin with a 45-minute uh, panel 
panel discussion, and then after that, we will open up the floor uh, for questions and answers, both from here, but as well as online. Uh, so if you have any questions and you're participating virtually, you can type them into <coughs> the comment box, and uh, our colleague uh, Luke, uh, from, uh, will be uh, following through, and we'll ask them out for you. Okay. Uh, so I thought uh, maybe we can begin with that, uh, following from Vincent's comments about the strengthening of the Istanbul Protocol, I'll dig a little bit further into it, um, possibly uh, beginning actually where it all began, in Turkey. Uh, so everyone, uh, Shevda uh, Chair of the Turkish Medical Association, and I believe board now of the Human Rights Foundation, uh, maybe we can pass it over to you. Uh, why, why, did, why did we actually need to strengthen the Istanbul Protocol, and why now, after so many years? Thanks, James, and dear colleagues, friends that we have struggled for a long period all over the world together. The solidarity is incredible for this world, actually. We struggle for humanity, we struggle for dignity, and in Turkey, of course, we had to struggle. Now, when I just looked at the <laughs> big book, I remember that we have started with 15 countries, and now we have 51 countries, actually. And when we started, we didn't have that improved internet connection, so it was very difficult even uh, to talk and to discuss the situation. Now we doubled what we had in the past. It has been 26 years. In 1996, we have started in Turkey again, uh, at Adana, a southeastern city, and finalized in 1999 in Istanbul, which means that we had the manual as Istanbul Protocol. This was a great honor for us uh, because the meeting was in Istanbul University uh, in that years. Why did we need that and why do we need to strengthen this document, this manual actually. Yes, we need guidelines for this situation because we know that the governments, the state authorities just resist to prevent to torture. They're just using torture as instruments uh, to just govern the countries in uh, the world, and particularly with the authoritarian regimes increasing in the world now, it is important to have guidelines. So we have the concrete guidelines to discuss the situation, uh, just to lead uh, the discussions throughout second opinions, and to monitor the situation in the countries, in Turkey also. For example, in Turkey, we had a training 12 years ago, and the government didn't want to involve Human Rights Foundation for this purpose, but wanted to work together with the official Institute of Forensic Medicine, which means that this is an organization which covers torture findings and falsified reports are widely known. So they didn't want to involve us, but afterwards, afterwards, we managed thanks to the international community and the solidarity. This solidarity is very important, not only the guidelines, but the solidarity of all the international community just supports us to work effectively in the country, in Turkey. And also just in the same period, I remember my Filipino colleagues, for example, they didn't have a proper law just prohibiting torture, but with the struggle together, having the guideline in our hands, so we all managed to have a proper torture law in the Philippines. And they had the Istanbul Protocol in the university curriculums for medical and law schools. So this is all improved. And I have my colleague Rusudan now in front of me, and we have worked together and we know that the Tbilisi uh, State Medical University now has the curriculum for the protocol. So it is important, but now we have some 
uh, new topics thanks to the struggle of different areas and also unfortunately we have armed conflicts in many countries in the world and for example children forcibly displaced victims of armed conflicts they need a strengthened coverage in the manner so it is important now we have the children included in Turkey also it is very important to include the children and uh, the last but not the least. Of course, we have to keep in mind that LGBT movement has been so strong for the last uh, 20, 30 years. And we need the manual, the guidelines for these people who have just serious violations against their rights. It was an important issue for Turkey. For example, the pride we has been banned in Turkey this week. So why do we need guidelines? Yes, we need guidelines to protect these people. And also the health professionals, we know the neoliberalism has changed the medical practice a lot. The healthcare systems have been overburdened with the demand of uh, exaggerated healthcare. And the burden is on the health professionals, they have to work hard, quantity is in front of quality, and they have only a few minutes to spare for their patients. In this context, how would we examine these people in a broader way, holistically, with psychological evaluations, together with the physical evaluation? So we need guidelines. We have to strengthen them. Thanks for the question. And I will continue afterwards. I hope I didn't do too long. Sorry. Let me speak about the broadening of our understanding of human rights and who it must apply to. Over the years, and our own understanding of Turkey uh, or torture. Uh, I, I hope then that maybe we could open it up to the rest of the panel uh, to discuss really in, in some practical terms, you know, what, what was, uh, I say, let's say, missing, or what was uh, uh, you know, in the original 2001 protocol, and uh, what, I mean, why did we need to strengthen it, and what, what was added to it, really, uh, to you know, bring it up to date with our current situation. Uh, maybe Nora, do you want to begin us? Uh, Nora Sveis, uh, representing the UN Special uh, Subcommittee on the Prevention of Torture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and hello to everybody. It's almost surreal to be here now in the same room with this in a paper, um, paper version after having worked with this and it being engaged in, with such a wonderful team for such a long time. As a clinician myself, as a member of a treaty body, and also now monitoring actively places of detention, I know so perfectly well how important uh, and how relevant this document is. And strengthening, of course, as has been described already, was really uh, a very important step to take. Well, we, we, you say, why update? Because thinking about, thinking about the manual, because it's not only a manual on documentation and, and the investigation, it's also a compilation of the most essential human rights document, especially with reference to, to torture and to ill treatment. So thinking about this being more than 20 years old originally, it has happened a lot during these 20 years, and all of this had to be included in the new uh, manual. And that's also one of the reasons why, why the page number has, has grown so much, which is a good sign because we have more tools, more mechanisms, more things to, to refer to when we, when we speak about human rights and the anti-torture torture work. And for, for instance, uh, the optional protocol or the CRPD were not <laughs> invented at the time the Istanbul protocol was. So there are many reasons and, and for, for good reasons for updating. And then the additional aspects. Uh, you asked about what is new and what has come in. Uh, there are two new chapters uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the Istanbul protocol that you have mentioned already. And one of them refers to the role and the obligations of health prof professionals in this work. This is uh, chapter number seven. 
It defines the obligations and the duties of health professionals in the work to document, assess, and report on torture. And why is this important? I think that what the chapter seven tries to do is to place the importance of the Istanbul protocol on the ground where professionals, health professionals are working on a daily level and on a daily basis. It is to try to engage with professionals who are not necessarily very aware of torture or have not to, working in places where often the issue of torture or treatment has not come over the radars to, to say it uh, that way. And, and it, makes, it makes it more concrete and it defines what to do in situations where there may be reasons to, or there may be signs of torture or ill treatment, how to deal with this, how to meet it, what to do. And we're speaking about addressing health professionals working in emergency settings, in migration settings, in centers where asylum seekers are being held, either, in, in, either detained or in open centers, we're speaking about people working in regular hospitals, general practitioners, uh, and all of these settings where we know so well that people may come with experiences of torture or treatment, but where it has often been not, not considered as their duty to look more into it. That has in many ways been uh, the part of the work done in more legal settings or in forensic settings. But now this is a way to really communicate with everybody in the health profession saying that this is your duty too, and referring of course to the international standards, but also to the, to the moral obligations enshrined in most of the, uh, of the ethics, ethics uh, in, in most professions. So I think this is one of the most uh, important things that uh, the chapter says. We know that it also provides a tool and guidance because there may be situations where uh, a doctor or a nurse or a psychologist see and observes and wonders, what do I do now? Where do I refer to? Who do I speak to? What kind of assessment do I do? Can I make a brief assessment and then refer to some more experts on this, for instance? That's discussed in, in the chapter. What about when people um, refrain from, from wanting the, the abuse reported? And this is especially so uh, in situations where people are deprived of liberty, because it's not easy for those health professionals working in those contexts uh, readily to report on, on torture and ill treatment because we know that the risk for reprisals can be very heavy. So this again is discussed. What do we do? How do we deal with the lack of, of consent uh, when, when the professional sees and feels that this has to be, it has to be reported on? It's very extreme, extremely important uh, discussions and it's often something that the uh, the professional cannot deal with alone. So we also very, very clearly uh, underline the importance of collegial contact and discussing this together with, um, with other professionals to find ways out of those dilemmas, because this work is full of dilemmas. And I think that strengthening the Istanbul protocol as has been done now, may also engage those who are working both in prisons, in places of detention, in those places where there is a risk of torture, uh, and also for those monitoring in these places. So we hope that this, this will make, make, make a difference in those contexts. Too many people working in these settings are not aware of the Istanbul Protocol. So this is something that states and all of us, both in civil society and as professionals, have to do. And just a final point on, on this. All of this is not possible to do in the way that we would like to do according to the Istanbul Protocol without sufficient training. And I want to remind you of the obligations of the state to provide training to health professionals and to others on the total prohibition against torture, on prevention, on rehabilitation, and all these issues. And it has to be uh, dealt with <coughs> as a part of the training and important challenges, which I will come back to, hopefully time uh, allows afterwards. But thank you again, and it's a great honor. And thank you so much, Vince, for what you have done and, uh, and what you are in this. It's fabulous. <laughs> Thank you so much, Laura. Uh, we heard actually the protocol, um, much of the guidance uh, that has been provided, uh, that this new the updates, are of a highly practical nature, uh, meant to address specific challenges that we have been sort of, uh, you know,
coming up against uh, over the last 20 years in communication. Uh, so it's actually remarkable that it's only grown this big. Yeah. <laughs> it's larger. <laughs> Uh, and uh, if you may notice that uh, actually one of the chapters to grow the largest, in fact, has been the chapter uh, number one on the legal standards, because so much has evolved over the last 20 years in terms of how we understand this torture and how to address it. Uh, so maybe uh, next, uh, we can turn over to Chris Esther, uh, representing the press. Um, Thank you, David. And uh, <clears throat> let me just say, first of all, that uh, it's been a great privilege for Redress to have been part of this process over the last number of years. So uh, thank you for that opportunity. Um, so yeah, in terms of um, the rather long chapter one, um, which is rather shorter than it was when it was in draft form, I hope, <laughs> uh, but the rather long chapter one um, helps us to perhaps understand some of the ways in which torture has changed, or at least in which our understanding of torture has changed. And perhaps I can pick out a few key phenomena um, from our experience at, at Redress um, of things that have perhaps helped to shape our understanding of torture in that last 20 year period. And there are a number of key things. And if we don't take a step back and think about all of these bigger global issues that have happened in that time, the first might be um, the fight against terrorism and the way that torture has been used as part of, of that fight against terrorism. And we have that, that history of CIA rendition, um, of use of black sites across various parts of the world, including in Europe. Um, there, was, uh, there have been a number of cases before the European Court of Human Rights, for example, El Masri uh, being, being one of the key ones in 2016. But, but there's been a number of others, and, and they basically found that the secret rendition and detention violates Article 3 of the European <coughs> Convention. So that's the, perhaps the first theme that has, has emerged to, to change our understanding. I, I'd say that perhaps the second one is situations of transitional justice. Um, it's not to say there wasn't transitional justice before the Istanbul Protocol, but, but if we think about how much the jurisprudence, for example, from the ICC or the other tribunals, the tribunal on Yugoslavia, on Rwanda, on Sierra Leone, how much that jurisprudence has developed in that last 20 year period. Um, the, the other aspect of transitional justice, which has been um, a, a focus of some of the courts uh, around the world, some of the human rights bodies and tribunals, it is the issue of amnesties. Um, so where can you actually stop people being held responsible for, for torture? When might that be appropriate? You had that landmark case uh, of, of Barrios Altos in Peru in, back in 2001, um, where, where the rejection of these prescription periods or amnesties and other ways of eliminating liability uh, for serious human rights abuses, including torture. And then perhaps the third area that I'd highlight would be that of discriminatory violence. And Shedna mentioned it uh, a, a little earlier on. Um, torture due to who someone is, um, due to their LGBTIQ plus status, <laughs> due to their gender, due to their race, due to their religion. Um, the increasing sensitization that we've seen over the <coughs> period um, of judicial and other bodies, and indeed the human rights framework more generally, to, to gender, um, the adjudication of gender based violence. Um, the intersection of sexual orientation and gender identity with violence, um, the whole de or the development of, of, of discrimination as, as a theme within that torture field, the recognition of rape as torture, um, firstly at the, uh, the Inter-American Commission, later in the court and, and then in other bodies as well. And of course, alongside those things, you've got the development of the special procedures at, at, at the UN uh, with um, special rapporteurs on torture, producing reports on gender and LGBTIQ plus perspectives on torture. Um, Manfred Novak in 2008, uh, Juan Mendes in 2016, really key developments which have reflected some of the jurisprudence as well. And, and I noticed when I was thinking about this before that Juan Mendes uh, talked about um, our analysis historically has failed to account for the impact of entrenched discrimination. Um, patriarchy, heteronormative behaviour and discriminatory power 
structures and gendered stereotypes. When we're talking about torture, things have moved on such a lot. And now that we've got independent experts on sexual orientation and gender identity, on the prevention of violence, on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity, such a lot has changed. And our understanding of these things has developed such a lot in that period. And then just the last thing that I'd highlight of those phenomena that perhaps have helped shape our understanding it, is that in, in respect of the state responsibility for the torture by non-state actors. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think particularly of domestic violence and of gender-based violence, um, usually we'd be looking at, uh, at, at find, trying to find accountability on the basis of state's failure to prevent or investigate or prosecute or punish. Um, and there's a fairly recent case of Linda Loesa against Venezuela, again in the Inter-American Court, um, where the state was found to be responsible for the appalling sexual slavery and torture of Linda Loesa uh, because of the state's inability to prevent or investigate the events. These were things that we hadn't really thought about when the initial Istanbul Protocol uh, was being conceived. Um, and so that was the first time that violence committed against a woman by the hands of an individual um, is classified as torture within the inter-American system. So those are just a few of the things that I think if we take a step back and look at those broader um, things that have been happening in the world, um, we can see how our understanding of, of torture has really developed in that relatively short period of time. Thank you, Chris. Uh, you know, it, as I can speak, uh, it occurs to me that, in fact, actually, I, I like very much the way more you have mentioned or talked about the protocol, not only as uh, a protocol or manual on investigation, but really as a comprehensive, in some ways, uh, tool or understanding of what we know about torture, both from a legal perspective as well as the medical and psychological, mm -hmm. and what we understand about the implementation mm -hmm. as well. Uh, you know, we, we've heard about how the protocol has been useful and even uh, uh, groundbreaking in, in achieving some of the, the, the large sort of uh, you know, achievements or wins that we have had in judicial proceedings and others throughout the years. Uh, but we've also often heard that uh, with the success of the protocol, we have run up against, let's say, uh, some, call, some call it the mischiefs, right? The, the opportunity for states then to also use the protocol in ways that may be used to stifle civil society. Um, and since, since you mentioned this uh, uh, in your, your opening remarks, maybe you could give us a few more words about the, the misuse of the protocol and how we try to address that. Sure. sure. Uh, thanks, James. Um, I want to preface the comments about misuse with uh, the, my response to the question about strengths and weaknesses, because uh, the the understanding of misuse came through our efforts to implement the Istanbul Protocol standards. And so regarding the strengths and the weaknesses of the IP, uh, there was a very specific history and focus that we had at the time when we created the guidance. That was medical legal, legal evaluations. And specifically in Turkey, uh, our uh, colleagues in civil society made these wonderful alternative reports with detailed documentation, very lengthy, et cetera, whereas the forensic state uh, uh, physicians had reports that were a sentence or two saying no injury or lesion. So we wanted to create, uh, force states really to abide by you know, proper standards uh, to document and to empower civil society to submit their own evaluations that complied with the Istanbul Protocol. We weren't thinking of people outside of the medical legal context so much in prevention and monitoring. Uh, actually, there wasn't prevention and monitoring through OPCAT at the time or NPMs, SPT. Uh, and we didn't really think about giving guidance to states of how to implement these standards. Right? We just created the standards for the individual actors, legal and clinical actors, uh, to do proper documentation work. Well, uh, in the past 22 years or so, uh, we've been asked to do capacity trainings and uh, to, to make sure that people are abiding by the Istanbul protocols. We've had vast experiences, all of my colleagues here today, in many different countries, some quite simple, where we're training health professionals and legal experts in civil society, and there's no resistance to uptake of the guidance and so forth. 
and other more challenging circumstances where states have approached us and wanted to implement this to protocol standards. And uh, in countries where torture is the norm and um, legal-based systems of confessions are the norm, uh, that's a very hard thing to change because doing effective clinical documentation alone does not get you to justice necessarily. Judges can turn a blind eye. Um, prosecutors uh, may not uh, respect their, their duty to, to prosecute and, and so forth. There's legal investigations are absent often. Um, and so we realized that we had to bring many parties together over long periods of time to give states a roadmap of how to implement these standards, including the conditions that are necessary for the guidance, uh, the political will, right? I mean, states have an interest in using something like the Istanbul Protocol as window dressing for human rights action, right? And it's a very uh, risky game to play in the states. And so there are a number of conditions that we've outlined in chapter eight, the new chapter on implementation guidance um, as necessary conditions for implementation. Um, political will, effective criminal justice system, adequate resources, good governance, uh, cooperation with international actors, and civil society uh, participation. And civil society is the bottom line when it comes to accountability. Um, and so we outline this roadmap. And briefly, it just consists of uh, legal, administrative, and judicial reforms. You have to criminalize. Uh, uh, torture, uh, ratify OPCAT, institute NPMs, have mandatory health evaluation, do trainings for relevant target groups, uh, have state forensic health professional reforms and training um, rules and practices. You have to monitor the process of implementation to ensure that what you think is happening is actually occurring, uh, sp specifically uh, the outcomes of the, the clinical evaluations of alleged torture and treatment. And there's a need for cooperation with people who have experience, uh, international bodies, NGOs, uh, and most importantly, the civil society. Um, and so we have engaged in these long efforts, eight years uh, and running in, uh, well, in Mexico and Central Asian countries and so forth, uh, and gained a great deal of experience. And unfortunately, getting to the misuse question, um, uh, Mexico, for example, they were very warm and welcoming uh, and approached us regarding the implementation of the Istanbul Protocol during one administration, the Fox administration. And when there was a change, um, that changed completely. And uh, they started weaponizing, quite frankly, the Istanbul Protocol uh, by uh, saying that people who alleged torture did not have full diagnostic criteria of post-traumatic stress disorder, and therefore their allegation of torture was false. And they, in turn, prosecuted them for a false allegation, uh, allegation against police. Also, they have excluded uh, clinicians because they're not medical. They had a strict read of the text thinking that medical expert referred only to doctors and so forth. These are games, in a way, uh, to try to turn the Istanbul Protocol into something that it's not. Unfortunately, there's a network of clinicians in Mexico uh, that fights against this kind of misuse of the Istanbul Protocol. And um, we've, we've added this concern to the new edition uh, to ensure that it, the Istanbul Protocol doesn't get weaponized. It's one of our primary concerns of that. So that's just one example. Um, and something that we all need to be looking out for, especially when UN bodies make recommendations to do the Istanbul Protocol. We had a recommendation from CAT to train people uh, under the military junta in Thailand. And basically we went there and told them, you're not ready, right? This is what it involves, this kind of commitment over a long period of time. They simply wanted the materials to be sent to them and for them to use the Istanbul Protocol as they wished. And so um, there are, that's a cautionary remark. <laughs> so, so as you've already heard uh, that it's not only is our understanding of torture broadening, but uh, our understanding of how to implement we have to have effective investigation and documentation has also grown over these 20 years. And that in, in some ways is captured both under chapter eight, uh, the new chapter on implementation, but as well then within the guidance, right, uh, to, to, to provide uh, an understanding of the directions that go. But with all of these uh, 
you know, let's say new, new standards or new guidance or new, you know, or, or further strengthening of the protocol. Uh, I do want to go into the, 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 I guess, the logical question following, which is, you know, states, this, this document is principally, first and foremost, a document for states, right? The, for, for states to abide by their uh, tax obligation um, to investigate and document torture effectively uh, whenever reasonable grounds are found to believe that it exists. Uh, but do we have state institutional buy-in on the Istanbul Protocol? And how do we strengthen that? How do we grow further institutional or state uh, buy-in for this, right? To ensure that now we have these implementation guidelines, they are actually abided by, or they, they at least provide best efforts to try to follow them. Marie, so the hard question to you. Thank you for giving me the question of a PhD. <laughs> um, that's, of course, a question that cannot be answered today. <laughs> and I'm sure there are as many views on this as there are people in the audience, because all states are different, all concepts are different. And I would even say sometimes you get a surprise if you come as a monitoring body, for example, to one state and you hear how the state has done and how they have trained everybody and how this is ingrained in everything that people do. And then you go and speak with a humble doctor in a remote prison and he tells you, oh yes, we ratified it a long time ago. And you realize that they actually do not know what they are talking about or what the Istanbul protocol is. So if I had a chance, I think I would carry from here a thousand Istanbul protocols and distribute them around the world. And then I would come back and get another thousand because there's so much to do. But the reason, of course, is not only that this is a tool for states, but also that I completely agree with what has already been said in the audience, that is, this is also actually a textbook. It's a book that is really, really helpful, not only because it, it provides the evidence, but for me, there are a couple of other issues that I would like to stress before moving on to talking about the, the UN bodies. Um, I think what, what the Istanbul Protocol does is that it proves to all of us that health professionals and lawyers have important tasks in common and the, through the Istanbul Protocol develop a joint language that we actually all speak. <laughs> and I think that's, that's very important also that, that this is the outcome of all this work to get a common language. And so that's, that's one thing. And the other thing I, I would like to stress is the, um, the analysis, so to speak, of dilemmas, because there's a lot of dilemmas when implementing the Istanbul Protocol. And I think it's hugely important that we understand these dilemmas, not only the dilemmas at a high level, but also the dilemmas that each professional faces when trying to do what we recommend them to do. Um, that leads me to, to speak a little bit about the, um, the SPT. As you all know, the SPT has a monitoring mandate. The SPT visits states to see how the status is on torture prevention in general. So not only the Istanbul Protocol, but of course the Istanbul Protocol is an extremely important part of, of that. And um, also there's the SPT and, and according to OPCAP also the states designate national monitoring bodies. So we all not only have SPT and, and the 91 member states and hopefully 13 signatory states that will soon turn into to member states, uh, but, but we also have the, uh, the 75 NPMs. And um, in the national preventive mechanisms, you find a whole vast array of people also who, for some, enter the torture prevention field for the first time. So there we also have the Istanbul Protocol as a very important guidance for them, not only on how to document, but also understanding the whole field. 
Um, so, so that is one one place where the Istanbul Protocol is, is really useful also in, in that regard. And the last thing I want to stress is how the Istanbul Protocol provides very concrete guidance. Both the SPT and the NPMs are there to provide recommendations. The NPMs typically at at institutional level, but also at country level. And with the Istanbul Protocol in hand, there's actually a lot of very concrete recommendations that are very easily made because they have already been written down. Being a monitor myself, I know how much time you can spend on formulating good recommendations because they need to be implementable, they need to be practical, they need to be smart or double smart, or <laughs> a lot to be said about formulating recommendations. And with this tool in hand, it will be so much easier to provide recommendations, not only at the, uh, at the institu institutional level, but also at the country level with chapter eight that provides very concrete guidance to the states on how to implement this. So that's all I want to share for now. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Maybe, uh, Lauren, you'd like to add something since you both work together with the SPT and other more. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, I think what Maria has also pointed to is, is the, the role of the Istanbul Protocol in prevention work because the Subcommittee on Prevention of Torture is, is a, is a, has, has the mandate to visit and to prevent torture. And but we know that uh, documentation and, and pointing to the existence of something such a crime as, as, uh, as torture also helps in strengthening tools and strengthening initiatives to prevent. So that's, I mean, that's one of the mantras that we will be working with, of course. But I'd also like to, to, uh, to focus on, on the Convention Against Torture and, and, uh, and the Committee Against Torture, where I always, uh, I've always also been a part of that. Uh, because as I see, the, the Committee Against Torture has an extremely important role uh, in, in making sure that the states actually understand what they're talking about when they speak about the Istanbul Protocol. Because as, um, as Maria also referred to, there are a number of examples where states may be a bit um, hesitant to know exactly what it is and how they are implementing it. That's again why it's so important to give some ABC on, on what to do. Um, but but if, we, if we look at uh, the Convention Against Torture and, and the relevance of the Istanbul Protocol, for instance, Article 2 on the absolute prohibition against torture and the prevention. The, the, uh, the Istanbul Protocol is very, very significant. And then Article 3 on all for them all. Uh, the, the recommendations from CAT over years now have been very strong in ensuring that there is a system out there to assess uh, injuries in asylum seekers in order for them also to be, to be assessed and, 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 and the injuries documented as an important contribution both to their health, of course, but also to, the, to, to substantiate their, their uh, appeal for protection or their uh, application for protection. So I think that this is, this is so important and the recommendations from CAT on these issues are very, very good. And then, of course, the, the Article 10 on training. Again, Istanbul Protocol is very essential in all recommendations to training. Um, and furthermore, the 13 on investigation. And we have discussed, we discussed yesterday that probably we can recommend CAT to strengthen the recommendations on the Istanbul Protocol as a tool in the investigative paragraph, maybe in uh, Article 13. But then, of course, in the 14 on the right to rehabilitation of redress, it's very obvious uh, why the Istanbul Protocol comes in so clearly. And then it's natural also to relate to the, the three general comments or the four actually, but the three general comments that the Committee Against Torture have written, has written, and they are also very clearly uh, taking up the role of, the, of documentation and investigation of torture. Again, the, the Istanbul Protocol is a very vital tool here. Um, in two, in the general comment two on prevention, general comment three on the right to rehabilitation, and the general comment four on not for the law or article three. So I think that, um, we should just keep on um, convincing the states why it's so important. And we hope, of course, to have some consensus on the application of the Istanbul Protocol by the states um, 
it's just something that we all have to work, work on. So let's keep up hope. As I usually say, when you deal with those terrible things, you need to have hope and you need to be an optimist after all. <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, the UN is an essential avenue for the Istanbul mm -hmm. Protocol for further in, uh, promotion of it. Uh, but the, I, I'd like to hear from uh, from the legal perspective as well and how it is used in uh, judicial venues and courts and other places. Mm -hmm. uh, so, as many of you may know, redress works with victims and survivors to basically obtain reparations. So the tools that the Istanbul Protocol provides are, are the things that we deal with on a daily basis. And almost all of our individual cases use medical legal reports and other evidence that has been prepared or gathered according to the guidance in the Istanbul Protocol. And we use that evidence to help prove harm and to ensure that reparations are adequate uh, to remedy the violations that have um, been suffered by the victims or survivors. So for us, it's, it's real and it's powerful and it creates accountability in individual cases. Um, I think the other interesting thing which we do um, as part of our work of address is to not just look at single individual cases, although those are massively important to the individuals involved, but to look at how the cases can be used as a strategic litigation tool in order to create structural change. Um, so some of you may be familiar with that kind of idea. Let me give you a very concrete example from our experience and a, a case that we, that we litigated before the uh, Inter-American Court of Human Rights with partners in Peru. A um, case on LGBTIQ plus violence um, involving a transgender Peruvian woman called Asul. And she was arbitrarily arrested by police in Peru in 2008. She was raped, beaten, and verbally abused due to her sexual orientation. And there were various medical reports that were prepared. Um, some were prepared by the state. Um, and were perhaps fell into the kinds of categories that we've heard from Vince. Um, some were obtained independently, and uh, both on Asul herself and on her mother. And so therefore, there was an immediate relevance of the Istanbul Protocol. Uh, the reports, first of all, on the psychological impacts were taken into account by the court. Um, and those were impacts both on Asul and on her mother. And the court, and this was a decision uh, two years ago now, 2020, uh, the court reinforced the importance of the Istanbul Protocol standards um, governing investigations, uh, especially those that are going to be carried out by the state. And it identified in that particular case that the key elements of torture, which I won't bother rehearsing because I'm sure you all know them, but the key elements were satisfied um, and the purpose was discrimination. Um, uh, but they were very clear, and it's a really interesting example of how they, uh, of how the court has, has gone back effectively to first principles and looked at the way in which this investigation was done and not done well, because it, it basically um, said that that discriminatory motive, and we talked about that issue earlier on, that discriminatory motive was not properly investigated by the state. On the contrary, it's almost the worst example of how a case involving an LGBTIQ plus victim could be investigated. The investigation was characterized by prejudice, by humiliation of us all, by the use of stereotypes, um, by the um, state um, doctor being uh, in the room with lots of other people. You know, everything you can imagine um, what, what was wrong about that investigation. Um, and so, notably, the court found that when investigating uh, violent acts, including torture, um, states have a duty to take all necessary steps to clarify if the, if the violence was motivated by prejudice and discrimination. And then there's a raft of wide-ranging reparations that the court orders, not just in relation to Asul and her mother, although those individual reparations are really important to victims, as I said, 
but looking at the way in which the Peruvian system needs to be changed, the way in which training needs to be improved, um, the way in which the, the system could change and the investigations could be better. Um, and uh, just a kind of a, a footnote, really, on, on all of that. Um, we've, we've kind of taken this case and then tried to go one step further. And so to look at the resonance that that case, even though it was decided in relation to Peru, the resonance that those issues have in relation to Africa and looking at the way in which violence um, can be... Uh, people, it's a very sensitive issue in Africa, obviously. I'm not running away from that. But I think that our experience is, and I'm working with partners in, in Africa on this, um, that in fact, whereas same-sex conduct can be a bit of a barrier and there's a lot of resistance, if one actually talks about violence, is it right that this person, even though they are LGBTIQ+, this person um, was the victim of violence? A lot more people would agree that that was not a good thing. <laughs> And so, and so to try and create that resonance and use that case that's decided in the Inter-American Court to try and um, promote change in a completely different context, yes, completely different, but sharing many of the same discriminatory motives that were really poorly investigated in Assault's case, but which the, the decision really gives us a roadmap as to how they could be done better. That. I mean, it's really interesting because... Uh, I mean, as, as we started that conversation, uh, our part of what's, what's special about the protocol is really the, the civil society engagement in it. Um, as you see, the, this updated version was actually a partnership between four civil society organizations uh, together with the four UN anti-torture bodies and then involving experts uh, across civil society, in fact, uh, from 51 countries. Um, you know, working with different NGOs, national human rights institutions, and so on and so forth, uh, bringing their guidance and advice together. Um, it, understanding the, the relevance of the protocol to civil society as well, um, I wanted to sort of turn the discussion a little bit and talk a little bit about how is the protocol uh, or this updated version going to strengthen civil society? You know, how do they use it now, or how does this empower them now? Uh, aside from just the recommendations from the bodies or these judicial decisions, but what else is in there for in civil society? Thanks, James. Yeah, of course, uh, we have talked about all the international bodies, treaties, <clears throat> but how to implement it and the implementation, as uh, Vince had mentioned. Is very important, but do the uh, state authorities uh, want to implement all these uh, guidelines, all the steps that we have to use in order to prevent or to investigate and document effectively? Of course not, because the state actors, while they practice torture, then they are the main perpetrators, actually. And if we leave everything in the hands of the perpetrators, it's not possible uh, to prevent torture. In Turkey, we know it uh, very closely. Uh, and particularly recently with the law rule of law, actually, we don't have any prosecutors or judges to effectively prosecute this process. Or the medical doctors would be scared to just document. Then comes the civil society's role, of course, and we need a stronger guideline for this purpose. And some concrete steps described for implementation in the country. So thanks to Wins, I know I have witnessed for nearly 30 years how he worked so hard and brought forward this document at the end, brought us together at the end. Uh, yes, civil society has a, a certain role for all the process because we know that uh, justice has a reparation effect at the end. And for this reparation, uh, we have to know how we should proceed with all these investigations and monitor them as the civil society. And for monitoring, of course, international bodies are very important. 
and we are so lucky to have Jan Smoky as one of the editors. Uh, so we feel uh, we just miss him now. Uh, we would be very happy together with him. Uh, I want to remind you one on one line of Das Nikmet. Uh, we miss him on our left shoulder. Uh, it is empty now. So we know that we will be together in a short time. Uh, yes, we have these monitoring bodies, but in the countries, of course, the civil society just takes the role of these international organizations and feels the support of this guideline, feels the support of the international bodies in the countries, because, for example, European Court of Human Rights referred to the Istanbul Protocol and referred to the medical legal evaluations of Human Rights Foundation in their judgments. And at the end, the Constitutional Court in Turkey had to refer the Istanbul Protocol and had to make use of the medical legal evaluations of Human Rights Foundation. So I'm sure this is the main issue for us, for building the reparation, for just making the perpetrators accountable for the things, as uh, means mentioned, famous crime in the world. Uh, and I also want to use the opportunity to thank Ge uh, Geneva Academy for this uh, historical event and historical building. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. We've we opened uh, the, the time for uh, question and answers, so uh, the floor is open. Uh, do you have any questions, comments? Yeah. Yeah. Comments? One question that went to my mind. First, congratulations to Vincent and his fantastic editorial team. It must be said again and again, I think. And the second, we have now the exciting tasks of implementing this in, the world, in different settings, not only in different countries, but as mentioned, transitional justice, universal jurisdiction, and so on, where it can be used. And we have one aspect from the World Psychiatric Association considering, for example, in the European Union, there's a framework directive for the victims of crime, and they stress the uh, necessity of support for victims of crime during the process, yeah, that during testimony, during the court process, also during examination, I think, that there should be a provision for psychological support because all the examinations and investigations bring up so many memories and the coping mechanisms break down and people are flooded and are often overwhelmed. It's going into the families also. So I think we can, one of the aspects of the practical implementation would be to look also in this aspect of psychological support during the process. Yeah, I, I think uh, this is something that we all experience in the documentation investigation process is the vicarious trauma or secondary trauma and working with uh, uh, victims and survivors of torture, and it's an important consideration. And a word on uh, the application. We have focused our efforts on developing uh, the new edition, and I think now is the time for us as a network of um, st and stakeholders uh, to, to do the rollout, to do the implementation. Uh, we have 180 uh, colleagues uh, through which we can uh, begin the process of strategizing rollout with institutions um, and across many countries. And so I think that involves awareness and training and uh, the hard work of applying the new standards, uh, some of the new uh, guidance in people's, in people's practices. Uh, and particularly the implementation uh, guidance. Um, Shebnam said it better uh, than I can. We are very hesitant to, to just uh, apply implementation willy-nilly, right? Because states are the perpetrators and they will use it to their advantage. Uh, it's a bit of a conspiracy to commit and conceal in many countries and to take the Istanbul Protocol and to turn it into uh, something that they're, they're abiding by um, on, a, on the surface is a, a very dangerous enterprise. Um, but there are... Uh, the framework is very useful. 
in order to compel the state to be doing the right thing in terms of implementation and creating the many necessary conditions for effective investigation and documentation. So I think together we can uh, work on that. Any other responses or I think that was an excellent uh, answer to the issue. Uh, any other questions? Questions from the floor? Um, it's been following along the same. Um, Lisa Henry from the IRCC. Um, of the 160 members, we have so many have been, I mean, they're waiting with daily breath for the launch of this uh, revised edition, the new edition here. There's so many of the torture rehabilitation centers around the world whose staff are eager to learn, want to get on board with this, are a little bit concerned about how thick this thing is. <laughs> Um, and in a most recent webinar, we were talking about, you know, some of the psychologists on staff get like, I don't think I can do this. It makes them nervous, right? There's so much here. Um, so the question to you is, or to the room, you know, how it, do we even get this rolled out? In RCT, we've tried to be cognizant of this fact, and we're working on an e-learning platform that will hopefully break it down into different chapters to make it accessible in a variety of different languages. I'm sure there will be other students, something similar, but how do we move from here to yes. make this tool accessible? When there's such a great appetite in the community to, to take this on board by the civil society. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. I'll take a stab at that. Um, I mean, the weight and the look of this is intimidating, uh, but you can be reassured that uh, at least from my perspective, it doesn't change actual practice that much. There are things to be aware of, and it's very hard to get your head around the sum total of what has changed. So we have done uh, the work for people in that regard. We've developed a PowerPoint on the changes of the Istanbul Protocol. So if you are a, a stakeholder who know the Istanbul Protocol, you can look at this 64 uh, uh, slide PowerPoint, and uh, it's a summary of all the changes, updates, mm -hmm. Um, clarifications and additional guidance. And it's a very useful tool, I think it will be a useful tool, um, to get people up to speed uh, on what may have changed or how they can use the uh, Istanbul protocol in different ways, um, in non-legal contexts, in implementation contexts, etc. And so uh, it's a task that we have to address for sure. And um, people will have to read it. There's no question about it. And the chat, and people who know the paragraph numbers for their purposes, they have changed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the refers you to the new to the new paragraphs and the relevant uh, information. So, um, and uh, I think through practice, people will uh, will learn. But it's necessary, as as others have said. It was much longer than this. And this is the sum total of the, the collective uh, understanding of the guidance that's necessary for effective investigation of documentation. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure we should mm -hmm. keep referring to a longer previous version. It's not the people. <laughs> uh, <Yeah. is> <laughs> and I just just, okay, just, just add two, two words to, to what they said. I, I, I completely, of course, agree with what you said, but I think at the same time, it's important that we remain a very grounded and a very concrete focus on what is this about? What, what, are, what are the different uh, professionals engaged in this, whether they're lawyers, psychologists, or well, health professionals in different ways, or medical doctors and nurses? What, what, what are they supposed to do? Um, why is knowing about torture, torture prevention, and torture doc documentation important for them? So I think in, in, if we can try to, to also to, um, to um, have some input into the training programs in the world, and I'm not speaking about specific trainings on torture, I'm thinking about educating psychologists, educating doctors, educating people in different settings, uh, in general about, about uh, the prohibition against torture, and in particular, what, what it means in their profession to know about documentation uh, and try to make that as concrete as possible. Because I've seen that often when I go visiting in places of detention, speak to doctors, speak to people working there, we can talk for, for quite a while. And then it's like, yes, it's true. This, this is probably more relevant for me than I have thought of. And this is what we have to do. We have to make it relevant for people, understand that this has to be a natural part of their life, so to speak, of their professional life, at least. Thank you. Okay, well, I, why don't we just go down the line? Because it seems like everyone wants to get the word in. So, should I say? I want to remind that 
the medical part of it or the health issues is a summary of our clinical practice actually. And we all know that in our hearts as health professionals. We have read thousands and thousands of pages, we have studied, and now this is the summary. But then you can check this summary in order to remember, but it is not different from our clinical practice. Mm -hmm. uh, it is only a reminder. So that's the only word I want to say. Um, Don't be scared. And those who know you with the Istanbul Protocol know that Annex 1 is, are the principles. Mm -hmm. um, it's a page and a half for legal and clinical investigation support. That has not changed. These are the minimum standards for effective investigation and documentation. We haven't changed those at all. And if you look at them, they are quite simple. Um, the, the guidance, the additional guidance that in, that's in here makes us smarter and more effective in our efforts to do the investigation and documentation work. So um, have no fear. <laughs> <laughs> I only have a short uh, additional comment really to make, uh, and that is just in terms of um, I absolutely agree that there is a need for us to move towards, if you like, disseminating this and making it usable and um, in, in, a, in a way in which people throughout the world, not just in Latin America, not just in North America, not just in Europe, not just in Africa, not just in Asia, all over the world, um, can, can make use of this. Um, I think that that depends on the network working together as well in terms of collaborating and that you know people who have particular expertise in certain areas are able to contribute to that process of dissemination and, and of training where that's necessary in, in more accessible forms because I think this might be a bit daunting for some audiences in, in the current uh, in the current form. And I think that the other issue that I've raised is is one of funding. So, so small organizations, even like even like redress, um, we would in some ways love to be involved in trying to help that dissemination process. But um, but it's it's working together with others and being able to access funding together to be able to put those kinds of things into place, which I think is also a challenge. It's a pleasure to be last because what no, I wanted to that. say, okay, <laughs> what I wanted to say has almost already been said. I just want to repeat that what is in there is what we already knew. We, I may not have known about the legal aspects, but you did, and I don't need to know all the details of that. I, I need to know the details of my own chapter, so to speak. Each chapter more or less has its individual target group. So we will all need to concentrate on our own chapters and that will make it way more, way easier for us to approach this huge document because we might need to read only 30 pages in detail and we can quickly run through the rest without being too concerned because we have good colleagues next to us who already know what should be known about that chapter. I, I guess uh, I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative, and I would actually just like to present a challenge to people because um, I mean I see here um, among, this, among the group uh, there are actually most of us are in fact practitioners, clinicians, uh, NGOs, society. We have the UN present, and it's to think as we discuss how we roll this out or how we do training, how we disseminate, to try to as well think about how do we do it in a way that increases accessibility um, and empowerment for individuals. Uh, as, as we've seen over the last several years, um, uh, both with COVID and with Zoom, but the, it was really an understanding for the IRCT as well, that in fact, uh, I mean, on Zoom, we do a training and it becomes so much more accessible to our members and our membership. Uh, we hold a general assembly and we'll probably never go back to in-person again. Uh, because really the, the, the modes and the methodologies, even civil society has changed um, very much, right? Uh, the way that individuals protest, for example, and you can see individuals, you know, young people sending each other Instagrams, preparing, uh, coordinating themselves. And so to understand as well that civil society has changed and to think about this. Um, from our side, you know, from the IRCT, for example, we are preparing an online curriculum for example, that uh, we're trying to develop so that it at least uh, makes our trainings more accessible in some ways, at least basic understanding of this level protocol. Um, we can try to 
prepare some kind of manuals and other tools to help to explain this. Um, actually, together with physicians for human rights and PHR, we're actually developing guidelines on how to do remote evaluation mm -hmm. uh, consistent with this protocol. The understanding that that has, in fact, increased or expanded uh, survivors' access um, over these years. So um, before we get to the question from OMCT, I know there are some questions online as well. Um, we did offer uh, to hear some, so please look. Yeah, just an update from the chat room here. We've been frantically <laughs> trying to, to monitor messages, and there are plenty of those, uh, especially from uh, our colleagues in Latin America and uh, Mexican friends asking about uh, the uh, Spanish translation, when it will be available. So I think it would be very good to hear an update on that uh, actual availability of the SMU uh, protocol in all languages. Uh, there were a number of questions about any planned follow-up activities, also how organizations can get in touch, I guess, with all of you uh, uh, about uh, such activities in, in their own countries. And then there were some questions about the power uh, point presentation you mentioned. So I think we'll try to follow up on, on all these questions uh, sort of separately. Uh, this will have a context, ICT uh, means or others, but I think on maybe on the on the question of translation and follow-up uh, activities, it, it would be good if you can update everyone. There were also a number of greetings to people on the panel in the vision. <laughs> 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 we, we are a big family. <laughs> we, uh... Well, that's, that's the issue of translation. I don't want to put OHC on the spot, so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to clear our host, that would be polite. Um, is there someone who will respond, or we are? We understand that the English. I mean, the English version is out. Uh, the Spanish version will be next. I, I can say for, for my OHC or my colleagues, if they're not here and willing. Uh, that the Spanish translation will be first. That is the priority that we designated then French and the other languages. Um, and uh, we anticipate some months. I don't think we know the exact number. I would imagine at least four. <laughs> I'm looking to my left. And we don't know exactly, but I do think it's important for us to collect uh, a list of interested parties uh, on uh, the issue of resources, trainings, when the translations will be available, et cetera, uh, so that we can be in touch with those individuals. Clearly, the people who are contributors to the IP and our networks, existing networks, uh, we will be contacting them about these matters. Indeed, I know that Physicians for Human Rights will, uh, like the IRCT, have a platform with a number of resource uh, products and uh, about training and so forth. We'll be having a webinar in September, it looks like, and so forth. So um, we'll use that list um, to to continue uh, to inform people. And we will have an event in Istanbul, hopefully uh, in the middle of October, uh, so that uh, we have uh, just the Istanbul protocol have copy now, and we will have the Turkish translation. Uh, I'm not sure whether it would be ready in October, but we will try our best. Yeah. At the original Istanbul protocol, the 2004 edition mm -hmm. of the Istanbul protocol has been translated in over 20 something languages. Yeah. So, so much of the, the impetus for translation has been done by NGOs, society, even the governments. <coughs> um, so we really rely on them for that uh, as well. Um, uh, for, for, to facilitate, although I'm not sure it really facilitates uh, now that I've seen the, uh, the final, but uh, we actually produced a red line version of the 2004 to 2022 uh, manual changes, uh, which was supposed to facilitate uh, translation, but uh, we'll hear about that when the translators <laughs> have a look. So um, we have five minutes left. The PowerPoint will be on the PHR website. I forgot to mention that. <laughs> we, we have five minutes left, um, and then we have wine, and I'm told that... Oh, no, uh, oh, no, no, sorry, yeah, 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 sorry, of course, of course. First, closing, and then wine. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it would be impolite in Switzerland to uh, delay that. So um, we have comments from 
point to OMCT. Any other, anyone else want to make comments? If you raise your hand and we'll go through those, we'll take those together. Okay, so one, two, three, two comments over here, just one. We're going to make a comment together. Okay. Okay. One, Sana, and then Thomas, and then we will close. I'm really happy to explain that. It's really, it's really a great achievement and it's a historical moment. So I'm very happy, but also I have a moment for Istanbul Protocol 1999. Since we were so enthusiastic and we created a, a training curriculum for professionals and translated to many languages, which is very easy to train people. And now in this Istanbul Protocol, we have a very sensitive uh, topics such as children, LGBTI, do you put on your mind to do such an amazing job, for example, like curriculum to train people and to identify this uh, achievement? Yeah, S S Sana, um, thank you for the comment. And yes, there is a model curriculum for clinicians on the uh, clinical documentation of torture that we developed some years uh, ago in, in conjunction with IRCT, it's an IRCT publication. And, um, it's a 250 page document with nine modules with uh, self assessments after and so forth. It's, um, it's very practical in its orientation uh, to train people to get them up to speed. And the short answer to the question is we haven't decided to, to use that as the training uh, resource just yet, but that is a possibility to update that with the new edition, uh, the new guidance and the new edition. Uh, alternatively, people can read that and uh, we can have PowerPoints on what the changes are, right? A supplement too. So I'm not sure about the strategy, but I, I do think one way or another, we will address the need that you're referring to. Yeah, we have actually even added modules to the model curriculum just for lawyers and judges, for example, and so I'm trying to uh, reach different audiences. Is, are there any other comments, or can we take the last couple of questions together so that, yes, yes, I know you've been sitting in the meeting <laughs> patiently. <laughs> I can wait to have this okay. rest so we have a conversation about Chinese culture, so adding any other regular convention is Cotterbra, senior legal policy advisor. So congratulations on these enormous steps and also for being to all these different sensitivities and views. Um, um, congratulations also specifically on, on, the, on the new chapter number eight. Uh, it's, it's really it's great in terms of, of giving more guidance to the organization. And um, I just wanted to make a very brief comment first. So first of all, indeed, uh, it was already a huge challenge, I guess, to put this together. Uh, but now we have a new challenge in front of us, which is, of course, the determinationized implementation. And um, from an ANTD perspective, as I said, also over other organizations working uh, against torture, through a comprehensive and complementary, like complementary block approach, we will be also very happy to participate in this effort, and maybe we could also discuss how to broaden the network of actors involved, so that we make sure that uh, the implementation stays we are strong and we are united voice. And and just one also question, so that also can be a question. And a second one is, uh, we are actually particularly happy that there's a, a specific uh, provision on. On the need to officially recognize and institutionalize this framework protocol, because as you said, since like sensitization is very important, but it's equally or more important to have it like legally somewhere, because otherwise states tend to kind of ignore that there's torture in the country. It's also many European states. So my question is actually, we do a very systematic work with the Committee Against Torture. Um, we facilitate the, the CSO participation uh, through the state review process on a systematic basis. And we will be happy, do you think it would be actually something that we can promote, like uh, to, to be more systematic when it comes to the recommendation um, to include actually legal provisions that the need to recognize the Eastern World Protocol as a legally, I, mean, I wouldn't say binding, but authoritative tool. It's something that you think that we could also, apart from the training, would be something already like uh, taken on by tax on a quite systematic basis, but the, the, the recognition of the Eastern World Protocol, now that we have this amazing tool, is it something that you think that we could actually uh, yeah, take on board uh, more also thoroughly? Yeah, 
take all the questions together and then like one minute to answer. Now it's between you and the the lines. <laughs> um, I, I need to first uh, thank the things I just cannot help it because there wouldn't be an update without your stamina to ensure soil retirement. So uh, thank you for the information and also uh, to the rest of the editorial committee. Uh, the comment I wanted to make uh, links to uh, what you said earlier is that of course the documentation investigation focuses on part of the puzzle. It's about whether it is actually prosecuted. And what I wanted to uh, raise here is that of course we have many countries in which the authorities uh, are not only not willing to implement the uh, Istanbul Protocol, they're, they're just not willing to prosecute torture. Mm -hmm. And so we have to uh, resort also to other tools, and universal jurisdiction was mentioned earlier. And I wanted to say this because I think uh, as, as the Latin as the war in Ukraine is, I think it provides a little of opportunity to promote universal jurisdiction mm -hmm. uh, in states. I think uh, many states would be more willing um, to equip their uh, legal systems to address these cases, which would benefit also uh, the fight against the community of torture in the longer run. Um, and the second thing I wanted to say is the use of new technologies. Um, the OSCE uh, is, for example, monitoring now, uh, like many others, um, potential violations of IHL and torture in Ukraine. Uh, and in the brave new world, we do a lot remotely. So maybe in the uh, in the implementation or in the translation into online tools is can be kept in mind that a lot happens with open source investigation, that we often do not have access to the victims directly or at least not in the first instance. And so some uh, techniques to be able to document uh, uh, torture even when you don't have immediate access to your uh, client uh, as, a, as a medical practitioner, I think would be something uh, very important. And my final point would be in our work on universal jurisdiction, we came across the fact that, of course, with all the cross border involvement, there's often a problem with the admissibility of evidence, um, the chain of custody, and, and the, the way in which evidence is preserved. Um, and that is also maybe something that when you translate this kind of protocol into training tools, which could be kept in mind um, that that we don't um, we don't hinder prosecution by the way in which we, we document um, and store the information. Thank you. Just very short, very short. I think it would be very exciting to have an online collection of educational materials that is multilingual and interdisciplinary and can be used. But you will have to make an editorial board to keep quality control of these materials because else lots of people upload all sorts of nonsense, including the Mexican government. Right. <laughs> just a uh, cue from the ICT. Can I just add to that universal jurisdiction question? I mean, Convention Against Torture has the obligation that states prosecute perpetrators of torture wherever the torture occurred. So it has a universal jurisdiction element in it. The first key Istanbul protocol nowadays requires states, if they're going to effectively investigate torture, to commit to universal jurisdiction prosecutions. Can, can, I, can I do something? Because we are, we are over time, um, and I, I'd like to refer the uh, complicated legal questions uh, <laughs> uh, over wine. Uh, so let's try to do that. Uh, easier to get our heads around those. Um, yes, obviously, we are going to be asking that as part of the guidelines for Chapter 8, uh, recognition of the Istanbul Protocol. Um, so that's clearly in there. And um, if we can then, uh, we'll close May I just from OHSR? Oh, of course. I need some people again. OHSR, for example, just on this issue, translation, I was trying to Indeed, I'm not going to give a timeline. But all uh, language requests have been sent to the, uh, to the, uh, the translation pool in Europe. And uh, one thing that I can say that uh, it is likely because, of course, because of the, of the demand and priorities there. French uh, translation usually is from the one that is. 
So it's take uh, longer than the others, but all, <laughs> all five are there, and, uh, and we will definitely be on the Thank you for the cooperation. Thank you, We're going to be providing Auntie's email later. <laughs> so, if you have any questions, I uh, to close, please. Uh, Vivian Nicholson, uh, speaking on behalf of the uh, UN Voluntary Fund for Victims of Torture. Mm -hmm. Very appropriate because the 26th, three days ago, was just an uh, international day for survivors of torture. Thank you. Yes. Uh, it would be a great pleasure to be here um, and, of course, to reflect on the fact that the fund um, helped to fund the original Istanbul Protocol development and this one. Um, and that's been a very proud point. I'm not going to go into all the talking points that the staff gave me about the numbers of people that we've helped. Uh, just to say that of the centres, for example, you know, it's, and it's around, well, it's thousands of centres that we look at for years, and then many tens of thousands each year of individual clients um, who are helped. But the point is that the Istanbul Protocol is used. It's used extensively. Um, and, it's, and it's the experience, it's the learned experience we've heard of people using the protocol, the original protocol, that has helped to develop the new protocol. There are a couple of formal thank yous that I would like to make. But first, I'd like to say that many members of the, board, the Fund's Board of Trustees, and there are only five of us, have been involved in our personal capacity, and particularly to acknowledge the Chair of the Fund, who took over from me at the end of March, Lawrence Mute, as well as Juan Mendes, who we all know from his other, on his previous incarnations as a special rapporteur, who has been involved in coordinating the legal chapter. And many of our peers on CAT, SPT, and the UN special rapporteurs, as well as other UN experts, have played defining roles. And the Secretariat has been very helpful for serving as the OHCHR focal point um, and the Public Publications Committee as well as the Rule of Law and Democracy section, who have coordinated the launch with the organisers, Christina Velikova of CAT and Yasmin Hadjouj. But I just wanted to comment on a couple of the things that have come out from me, from the talking points that have been made today, the, the different things. All of us have got some experience of dealing with survivors of torture. I, I'm not going to use the word victims as part of our um, title, but it's not a, a word I like. Um, and we've all seen the importance of having a, an open and effective process for getting people rehabilitation, and I include within rehabilitation legal redress, because I think that that is one of perhaps the most powerful parts of rehabilitation. And whether we look at individual cases and I was involved in a case of a, an Iraqi citizen who was killed while in British army custody uh, in dealing with a public inquiry. I gave evidence to that on the, the role of doctors in reporting what they'd seen. Or whether we look at things like people in detention, I'm glad to see here Henan Reyes, who was very uh, instrumental in developing the International Committee of the Red Cross in Persons in Detention Unit which makes sure that the ICRC help within countries to look at what's happening within prisons and formal places of detention. And that does help an enormous and protect an enormous number of people. Although of course it's not always the formal places of detention that are important. Working with them, one of the things I found that shocked me was that many of the physicians I spoke to who were running the hospitals in prisons had never even heard of the Mandela rules. Oh, yeah. At which point you begin to wonder how you're going to get them to read this manual. And the answer has got to be just going on and on and on about it and keep making it impossible for people to avoid the subject. But we're also dealing with times of change, social change in particular. And the LGBTQI plus or whatever the acronym becomes doesn't really matter what the acronym is. What matters is that our definition and understanding of people who are at risk, particularly from governments and societies that are intolerant of otherness, and which will then define otherness in a way that fits with particular prejudices, 
is a problem, and it's a problem that will always be there. So we have to deal with that at the same time as trying to prevent, because preventing torture does require us to recognise that, that above all else, we must value all people. We must value not just the, the media, the, the local norm, as it were, but we must value everyone, whether they are members of our society or just visitors to our local communities and society. And we should never give up on justice. And in that, I was very taken this week that a 101-year-old man was found guilty of war crimes from World War II in this week. There is never an end point to when justice can be sought. It is a very, very long delay, but it is justice of a sort. At different times, in different contexts, I visited a lot of different places and spoken to people involved in the anti-torture movement. I can remember going to Kashmir where the prison doctors told me that if they weren't involved in the torture, then they were um, attacked by the guards. And if they tried to protest the torture, they were attacked. They were attacked by the guards if they were protesting the torture. If they weren't, if they were involved in it, then they were attacked by the prisoners. They couldn't win. What made a difference? A medical association. Somebody else mentioned collegiate strength. The point about this is this is a document not just for governments. This is a document for everyone. And if we can get every medical association, every nursing association, every psychological association, every lawyer's association, every journalist association, how powerful they can be, to actually recognise that there is this document. It is a book of reference. It will point out what you need to think about when you are faced with a dilemma. And that is the strength of this new document. All sorts of people know about this and the training programmes we've gone into and will be enormously important. And by the way, I'm sure that you all agree with me, professionals of all sorts love to learn. And we must actually say to them, this is something you can learn from. Here is a source. It's all been boiled down. It's all the essentials that you need to know. So learn from this. And then maybe some of them will start to read around this and to actually start to get involved in developing materials to help others. And I do expect that the fund will get applications in the next few years for the capacity building programme. And we will look forward to looking at that. And we will be sympathetic. Uh, but I want to thank everyone who was involved in the process and in today's process. But most of all, there's one person I think I want to thank, because without him, this would never have happened. And that's Vince. I'm not going to tease him about retirement, because I'm retired as well, and retired as an office. Nobody ever retires properly. But just to say, Vince, without you, this wouldn't have been possible. And your good temper and your amazing ability to adapt to everything and to keep everybody engaged has been enormously important. And we really should call it the Yankino version. <laughs> <laughs>